We have gathered this morning to celebrate the completion of Sefer Tanya Kadisha, the entire thing. It took us nine years. We started in September, nine years ago. I don't remember the year. 2011. And we finished all the five sections, <clears throat> uh, somewhat against the advice of our advisors. They said we should do the first three sections and then quit. But we, we stuck with it. We did all the five sections, and now we're ready to start again. Wow. So we're so happy that you could join us. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Rabbi Shays Taub. Rabbi Shays Taub is a shliach of the Rebbe in Cedarhurst, New York. Rabbi Shays Taub is the uh, d designer of the Tanya map, which we have used many times in our classes. Also, the author of Soul Maps, right. ALI course, and, uh, and he, he speaks about Tanya. It's his favorite topic, I think. My favorite topic, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So it's when you said I had an opportunity to speak about Tanya in Cleveland, I said, let's do it, absolutely. All right, take it away, All Robert. Right. Tom. All right. So I'll tell you a, a joke that those who've studied a little bit of Tanya will appreciate this joke. If you haven't studied any Tanya, you may still get the joke. The joke is like this. There was once a guy got married and on the first morning after the wedding, he set his alarm for 5 a.m. Why 5 a.m.? Because he wants to get up before sunrise on the first day of his new life and he's going to go to the koilo you know the the place where the married men learn instead of treating himself like he's on vacation because he just had his wedding last night he's going to get up the first morning of his new life he's going to go to the koilo he's going to study torah all day he's going to start his new life on the right foot so he sets the alarm for five in the morning he says the alarm goes off at five in the morning He's ready to jump out of bed to start his new life. And all of a sudden, who starts talking to him? Wouldn't you know it? The Nefesh of Bahamas, the animal soul. And the animal soul says to him, relax, get some more sleep, don't rush. And he's ready to listen to that. Sounds convincing. But all of a sudden, who shows up? He hears the voice of the nefesh holikis, the godly soul. The godly soul says to him, what are you talking about? You set the alarm for 5 a.m. You knew exactly what you were doing. You had the right idea. You want to start your new life on the right foot. Get out of bed. And he's about to listen to that. But then who spoke up? The nefesh abamis, the animal soul. The animal soul said, why do you have to get up before dawn? You're going to make yourself sick. That's a good idea. Your wife's not going to appreciate it if you make yourself sick. Go back to bed. Nefesh Alakis, the godly soul, chimes in. He says, what are you talking about? Your wife's going to love it. She's going to be so proud of you that you got up before dawn. You went out and you were studying Torah all day. Of course, get up. Nefesh Bahamas, the animal soul, chimes back and he says, no. You were, this was your wedding night last night. You are tired. You need more sleep. Go back to sleep. Nefesh Alakis, the godly soul, says, no. Get up. Start your new life on the right foot. And they're going back and forth. Animal soul, the godly soul, the animal soul, the godly soul. So the guy says, I want you to know, everyone, in the end, who won? The nefesh kiss, the godly soul won. He won. It took him six hours, but in the end, he won. The joke is he got up <laughs> at 11 o'clock, right? It took him six hours, but in the end, the godly soul won. He got out of bed. Okay, that's the joke. Um, so <laughs> why was I thinking of that? In addition to the fact that it's just a good Tanya joke. <sighs> they told you, don't do it. Give up after the first three volumes. You don't have to continue. You don't have to do the whole Tanya, especially the hard parts at the end. With the Geras HaKadish and the Kuntus Achren and all the Kabbalistic stuff. And it took nine years, but in the end, who won? The Nefesh Halakis won, the godly soul won. It took nine years, but in the end, 
good prevails and you accomplish something. So to everybody who stuck with it the whole time, Mazel Tov on your completion. To everybody who was there most of the time, Mazel Tov also on your participation. To those who showed up uh, one time in year three and you showed up uh, one time in year five and one time, also Mazel Tov because at least you're in the loop. And anyone who never even came to one class from the whole nine years, but you're here today, the biggest Mazel Tov to you because you're about to start something new, God willing, with God's help. So Mazel Tov to all of us. Um, <laughs> there's a story, true story. The, the, the other story was a joke. It wasn't a real story. Although maybe you could say it's a really real story because it's universal. But no, this is an actual story. It happened to an actual person to an actual uh, a chassid named Zalman Garari. And um, so this Rabbi Garari was very much involved in uh, business and communal affairs, and because of that, he traveled. He used to travel. And uh, one day, he got to JFK, and this is years ago. We're talking about, you know, in the 50s or the 60s. I'm not sure what year this happened, but... He goes down to JFK. I, I guess it wasn't even called JFK at that point, right? At a wild airport, maybe. So maybe it was in the 60s or 70s. The point is he goes down to JFK, which is the international airport in, uh, in New York, and he was supposed to take an international flight, and they canceled the flight. Now, this was a route where they – it wasn't like – you know, it wasn't like, you know, a flight from New York to Boston where, you know, if you miss one, <clears throat> you know, if you're flying New York to Boston, New York to D.C., whatever. So you miss one, you wait 30 minutes, literally you wait 30 minutes and there's another flight. This was an international flight where there's one, there's one route, that's it, and then they, they fly once a day. So um, the flight was canceled. And there wasn't going to be another one till till the following day. Now, other than the fact that it was annoying, you know, it's annoying that you go down to the airport and then you're told that the flight's canceled and you have to go back home. But in addition to that, there's also a sort of a conundrum that this caused. There is something called the tzava, the the the, the will or the the testament of Reb Yehuda Chassid. And actually, many people are sort of indirectly familiar with this uh, document. There are certain Jewish customs that are not halacha, they're not legally binding, they do not have the force of halacha, but that many people follow because they're mentioned in this will of Yehuda Chassid. Um, for instance, I'll just give you an example. You may have heard, may or may not have heard, but for instance, if two brothers marry two sisters, a pair of brothers, each one marries a pair of sisters. So according to Rabbi Yehuda Chassid, they're not supposed to live in the same town. They should live in different towns. Okay, that's not halacha, but it's Yehuda Chassid said, so many people are care careful to follow it. Or... <coughs> Um, <clears throat> give you another one. Um, you shouldn't polish your shoes on the day of a trip. Okay, why not? Whatever, there's different explanations, but you shouldn't polish your shoes on the day of a trip, which is funny because the only time I ever have an, an opportunity to polish my shoes is on the day of a trip when they have the shoe shine guys at the airport, and I never use them. So that's why my shoes aren't shiny. But, um, or, um, when you're doing construction in a house, you don't block off a window or a door. And there's a whole procedure what to do. Instead of blocking off the window or the door, there's a way, there's a way around it. But I'm just telling you for background, there's this thing called the, the will of Yehuda Chassid, and it has interesting rules like this in it. And some of them make more sense, some of them don't seem to make as much sense. Um, one of the rules there that he says, it's advice that he gives. So one of the pieces of advice that he offers. He says that if you leave your house to go on a trip and you forget something, 
you should not come back into the house. You should just go on your trip. So for instance, let, let's say you, 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 you're going on a trip and you get in the car and you realize, oh no, I forgot my sunscreen. So Rabbi Yehuda Chassid would say, leave the sunscreen in the house. When you get to the hotel, you'll go to the shop and you'll buy some new sunscreen. Do not go back in the house. Okay, that's what he says. Once you left the house for a trip, finish, you go, you go to your destination. You don't come back until you've finished the trip. So this Rabbi Garari, he had left the house for his trip. He made it to JFK and they told him the flight's canceled. So he had a real serious question. Um, does, this, does this mean, now that the flight is canceled, that it's impossible to travel, so therefore he's not choosing to go back home. There, there is no trip today. And therefore he can go back home. Or perhaps um, he is supposed to, if he wants to adhere to the, to the advice of Rabbi Yehuda Chassid, maybe he's supposed to get a hotel next to the airport, do not go back home. I mean, from Crown Heights to JFK is 20 minutes if there's no traffic, right? But uh, so he's not supposed to go back home. He should get a hotel, stay next to the airport, and not come home until he's finished his whole trip. So he really, he didn't know which, which way to go. So he called the Lubavitcher Rebbe's office, the secretariat, and he spoke to the Rebbe's chief secretary, to Rebbe Kadakov. And he told Rabbi Chadakov his dilemma. So Rabbi Chadakov said, hold on. And Rabbi Chadakov spoke with the Rebbe. After speaking with the Rebbe, the, the secretary, Rabbi Chadakov, says to uh, Rabbi Garari, the Rebbe says like this, learn a chapter of Tanya. When you learn Tanya, you become a new person. It's not just when, when you learn Tanya, you now know something new. When you learn Tanya, it has a very um, transformative effect. So you, you don't just know something new, you become someone new. So the Rebbe says, learn a chapter of Tanya, and now you'll become a new person. And consequently, when you go home, you won't be going back home because it's not the same you who left home as it is going to your home, two different people. You were one person when you left the house, then you learned a chapter of time, you became a new person. Now that new person is going to your home, not back home because he was never at your home because he's a new person. Rabbi Grari said, thank you. And he obviously he learned the chapter of Tanya and he went home and he was able to sleep in his own bed that night. And then the following day he went on the trip. But there's an epilogue to this story. And to me, the epilogue is more interesting than the story itself, which is often the case. Those who are familiar with Jewish stories often realize that the real, uh, the real flavor is in the epilogue, if you know how to look for it. The epilogue is the following day, as Rabbi Garari was about to leave the house, the phone rang. And it was Rabbi Chadakov, the Rebbe's secretary. And he asked Rabbi Garari to follow. The Rebbe would like to know if you understood that yesterday's advice was serious, sincere, ernst is the Yiddish word, like related to the English, earnest and that you did not take it as something, in Yiddish we say, gleich vertel, something cute, something pithy. The Rebbe wants to make sure that you know that what he told you yesterday was serious and that you shouldn't take it as something cute. That's my rough translation into English. That's the epilogue. So that's why I say the epilogue is more 
compelling to me than the whole story itself. Not that the Rebbe gave this advice, learn a chapter of Tanya and you'll become a new person. To me, what's really compelling is that the following day, the Rebbe who had countless items to deal with on a daily basis, took the time to make sure to confirm that the person he had spoken to yesterday took him seriously. To me, that's mind blowing. The Rebbe wanted to confirm that this person had taken him seriously. And who was this person? This person was a devoted chassid. This wasn't some person who had heard about the Rebbe and was checking out, you know, what kind of advice can this wise rabbi give? This was a devoted chassid. This was somebody who was a disciple, a student, a follower, someone who was totally devoted to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe wanted to check and make sure that this person didn't just think it was cute or clever. The Rebbe wanted to confirm that this person was taking it seriously, that when I said, learning a new chapter of Tanya, learning a chapter of Tanya makes you into a new person, that that's not an expression, it's not a gimmick, it's a literal thing, it's a serious thing. I mean, who takes the Rebbe seriously if not his most devoted chassidim? So if anyone would take the Rebbe seriously, it would be this chassid, and yet the Rebbe wanted to make sure that he was taking it seriously. To me, that's, that's so powerful. The Rebbe wanted to make sure, and by extension, not just this chassid, but us as well, because we're learning from this story. The Rebbe wanted to make sure that we know that when we say learning Tanya makes you a new person, that's not a catchphrase. It's not an expression. It's a literal description of what happens. It's not just you with some new information. It's a new you. It's a new you. Which really, if you think about it, that is a description or a definition of teshuva. Teshuva is one of those elusive Hebrew words that we try to translate. Right? On Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we have uh, one of the highlights, the emotional highlights, dramatic highlights of the prayers are when everybody calls out that Tshuva, Tfilot, Daka, Ma'avirinus Reyag Zeiro, that Tshuva, repentance, Tfila, prayer, Tzedaka, charity, they mitigate the severity of the decree. And everybody calls out with such fervor. Chova, Tvila, Tzedakah. What's Chova? Teshuva, Teshuva. Shuv means to return. Teshuva means return. So we translate it as, as, as repentance, but it's return. And well, why do we call it return? Because we believe that we are essentially good. Right? You have that Nefesh Elikis, which is the real you. That's what we learn in Tanya, that the Nefesh Elikis is the real me. And when I am allowing the Nefesh Abamis to run my life, when the animal soul is calling the shots, that's a, that's a betrayal of self. So that's not authentic. Just because it's natural doesn't make it authentic. Right? There's a difference between the two. The Nefesh Abamis, the animal soul, may be natural, but it's not authentic. Authenticity is being loyal to the real me. And the real me wants God. The real me wants every opportunity to be selfless and to make a sacrifice so that I can be a conduit for God to be present in this world.
That's the real me. And anytime I don't do that, anytime my next behavior or speech or thought isn't a sacrifice to God, as the godly soul desires it to be, and instead it's a an expression of self-will, of what I want, what makes me comfortable, that's actually a betrayal of self. That's an interesting concept. By doing what I want to do, I'm actually betraying myself. Because there's two eyes. I don't mean two eyes. I mean I, like ich. There's two me's. There's the false me, the animal soul that wants to be comfortable. And there's the real me, the godly soul that just wants God to be comfortable. That God should be in this world in a revealed way and to be able to openly rule over his world and to be known by his creations. So <clears throat> when we talk about the real me and being genuine, being loyal, not betraying myself, that means to follow the godly soul. And that's why we call it return. Teshuva means returning to your true self. So if your true self, meaning your godly soul, were completely calling the shots, meaning if your godly soul were the only arbiter of what you should do next, say next, think next, what would life look like, right? And if life looks like that, that's called teshuva. That is teshuva. Or another way of saying it, like we were saying before, is you are a new you. You became a new person. Teshuva is, I'm not that guy anymore. The Rambam talks about this, how Teshuva works. He says that when you really thoroughly do Teshuva, the reason you're no longer culpable I mean, obviously, if there's something where you wronged another human being, you have to make restitution to the other human being. And that's one of the things we do before Yom Kippur, before the Day of Atonement. If there's anything that's between one human being and another, you have to obviously make restitution to another person um, in whatever way is appropriate. But once you've done what you need to do, and now the question is, you know, culpability between you and God. So if you do teshuva, you're forgiven, completely forgiven. And what does it mean you're forgiven? Not only do they not bother you, I mean, by they, I mean the heavenly court, not only do they not like remind you of what you did, but they expunge it from the record. It's erased. It's gone. It's like you never did it. So the question becomes, you know, how can that happen? I mean, all right, fine, we won't punish you, but at least there should be some type of a record. Okay, so the, the sentence was commuted. All right, so you're off the hook. But there should be a record that you did this thing. You did it. You, you don't believe in personal responsibility? You did the wrong thing. It should, I mean, it should be on, I'm not saying public record where everybody could look at it, but between you and God and the heavenly court, the angels, the clerks up there, they should be able to look it up that you, uh, you did such and such. And so the Ramam explains, no, because you didn't do it. Well, yeah, you did. We have the security footage. We can see that you did it. And that's not me. Well, it looks like you. Yeah, it looks just like me, but it's not me. That's the old me. That's not me anymore. I remember Rabbi Dr. Tversky, Abraham J. Tversky, who um, was in, in many ways a mentor of mine. Um, I remember he told me a story once about going to an AA meeting. And uh, this really ties into the title that uh, Rabbi Friedman told me today's session uh, is called. So uh, Rabbi Tversky, Rabbi Dr. Tversky tells me he goes to an AA meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, he said, I hear a guy get up 
not, not a Jewish person, a non-Jew, and tell his story. And he says, and after that, I finally understood what the Rambam, what Maimonides means when he says that uh, when you do teshuva, not only is the past wrong forgiven, but you're not the same person. You're, you're no longer considered the same person who did the, the wrong. So he says, I hear, I hear this guy, sober, a sober alcoholic, you know, a non-drinking alcoholic, somebody who has gone through the program of recovery, the obsession has been lifted, and he no, he no longer lives that way. I mean, he can't safely drink ever again, but thank God he's not plagued by that, by that obsession. He's able to live free from his, uh, from his alcoholism. So he gets up and he, and he tells his whole story, and he concludes the story by saying like this, the man I was used to drink. The man I was will, will drink again. Thank God I am not the man I was. You hear that? The man I was used to drink. The man I was will drink again. Thank God I am not the man I was. You hear that? Rabbi yeah, Dr. Tversky said everything clicked for him. The guy didn't say, I used to drink, but I don't drink anymore. It's not what he said. He said, the man I was used to drink. The man I was will drink again. That man, that's what he does. He drank, he will drink. Thank God that's not me, though. I'm not that guy. I experienced a transformation, which is the whole point of recovery is a, you know, a personal transformation. So it's not like I learned how to control my drinking better. No, I, I'm not the guy who has that obsession to drink anymore. So think about it like this. The man I was used to sin. The man I was will sin again. Thank God I'm not the man I was. Isn't that what, what it says in chapter 12 of Tanya? When it, when it introduces the Benini. Chapter 12. The Habenini, and who is this Benini? Who is he? He's someone who never sinned and he never will sin. He never sinned, he never will sin. Okay, so that eliminates all of us. Because if you're saying to be a Bainini means you never sinned and you never will sin. First of all, he never sinned in the past. Well, anyone who sinned, that's it. So we can't be a Bainini. And he never will sin in the future. What about free choice? We all have free choice, so you can't guarantee you won't sin. Of course you could. And how do we understand this statement? What we understand is that this is the definition of a Bainini. That when you become a Bainini, when you're in that state of mind and spirit called being a Bainini, then at that point, you're a new person. And whoever you were in the past before you became a Bainini, that's not you anymore. So your sins in the past, those aren't you. That's another person or an earlier version of yourself, but that's not you today. And in fact, that's the way the whole thing works, is that that's not you. You're a new person. If I were still the same guy who used to sin, then I can guarantee you I'm going to continue to sin. Maybe I'll control it a little better. Maybe I'll hide it a little bit better. But I'm still the same guy. Why should you expect radically different behavior? But if I'm a different guy, so then what I did in the past, that wasn't me anymore. That isn't me anymore. And not only that, but I can tell you about my future. As long as I'm a Bainini, I will never sin. The man I was used to drink. The man I was will drink again. Thank God I'm not the man I was, meaning I don't have to drink again. As long as I never go back to being that person. So herein lies one of the great paradoxes of Tanya. And those who studied Tanya will probably appreciate this. You know, 
if you ask someone, what's Tanya about? Is Tanya about focus on your behaviors and don't worry about your insides, right? Fake it till you make it. Just worry about your outsides, worry about your behaviors. That's much more manageable. And don't worry about temptation. Don't worry about, you know, the, the inner voice. Just ignore it and just focus on behavior, okay? So that's one proposition. Maybe that's what Tanya is about. Or is Tanya, conversely, is Tanya about deep personal transformation, becoming a totally new person who has new ways of thinking, not just new thoughts, but new ways of thinking, rewiring your mind, and new feelings, new ways of feeling new priorities, new, you care about things you didn't used to care about, and then you don't care about things you used to care about. So which one is it? Is Tanya focus on behaviors? Or is Tanya transform your ideas and feelings? Or to put it in slightly different words, is Tanya about focus on the outsides and don't worry about the insides? Or is Tanya about, hey, now you have the power to transform the insides? And like any Jewish question where we ask, is it this or is it this? The answer is yes. It's both. It's both. The paradox of Tanya is that it's both. I'm never going to be a tzaddik. When I'm at Sadiq, then I don't even want what I shouldn't want. I can't even imagine what that feels like, but you know, I guess I can sort of think about things that are prohibited according to the Torah that I have no desire for, right? Like drinking a cup of blood. I really have no desire to do that. So I guess that's how a Sadiq feels about <laughs> all, the, all the, the prohibitions that we find so tempting. So, uh, so attractive. So a tzaddik would find all those sins about as attractive as drinking a cup of blood. Yeah, okay, fine. But I'm not going to become a tzaddik, so, so fine. But what I can do, according to the al Rebbe, is I can become a bainani. And what does it mean I become a bainani? That's not just a description of my behaviors, that's a description of my personality. You understand? It's the paradox of Tanya. On the one hand, yeah, the focus is on behaviors, because I can control my behaviors. I can't will myself to want what I don't want. The heart wants what it wants. And that's why I can't become a tzaddik. Because I just can't will myself to only want mitzvahs and to no longer be attracted to, we'll call them non-mitzvahs. Can't force myself to want what I don't want, and I can't force myself not to want what I do want. So I'm not going to become a tzaddik. But when I say, fine, so I'll become a bainini, a bainini doesn't just mean that I'm going to only change my behaviors. Becoming a Benini means I am going to change who I am. I'm going to change my personality. The man I was is not the man I am. It has to be. By definition, it has to be. It is Teshuvah. I am not that guy anymore. So what does it mean then? I'm not that guy anymore, but I'm, but I'm not a Tzaddik. So what's the difference? I, I, I mean, it's like, like word games here. You're just quibbling about semantics. Oh, don't call it a tzaddik. Call it a bainini. Which one is it? So let me explain. I'm not going to become a tzaddik. A tzaddik means that I, for all intents and purposes, I only have one set of desires, the desires of the godly soul. And that's it. That's all I want. And there's no conflict. I don't have to learn to manage any conflict. There is no conflict. 
Abandon me means that I very much have two sets of desires. I have uh, the desires of the godly soul and the animal soul. And the desires of the animal soul make themselves very clear. They're not shy, you know, to come to me and say, hey, let's do this indulgent thing. Let's do this comfortable thing. Let's do this easy thing rather than the right thing, right? So that's, that's how I'm not a tzaddik. But at the same time, when I ask myself, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? I'm a person who only listens to my godly soul. Now, I'm not a tzaddik. So it means that I'm going to have to have the noise of the animal soul. The tzaddik is free from that. He doesn't have that noise. So I'm going to have that noise. But I know now that it's just noise. It's like... This is not a complete parallel, obviously, but maybe metaphorically it can help us. You know, there's such a thing as an intrusive thought. And to some extent, we all have intrusive thoughts, right? Like all of a sudden you'll think of something terrible, something appalling, something that not only you would never do, you don't even want to do, not even as a fantasy, and just pops up in your head, right? Or, you know, you're driving on the highway and you think to yourself, Oh no, what if I grab the wheel and I drive off and I go flying over the embankment and I, right? Now, those types of things, I don't know why Hashem made our brains that way, but that's how our brains are made. They, they <laughs> sometimes we, we just like think crazy things, right? Um, and I don't want that thought. Now, there are most of us, what we do is we recognize that that is like the mental equivalent of a burp. It's just a burp. It's a mental burp. And we ignore it. And we move on. But what can happen is some people um, get really scared of, their, of these intrusive thoughts. And it becomes actually an obsession. And then there becomes the obsession of not having the thought, which of course you're going to have the thought. Then you know, the guilt, I had the thought, and then it becomes, you know, all-consuming. What I'm saying is that, you know, when, when we do teshuva and we return to our true selves, we may not be tzaddikim, we may not be free from having that voice of the animal soul. In fact, we will not be free from it having that inner voice. But we can recognize that it's not the real me. And in that sense, I'm not just doing different, I've become a different person. I'm not just choosing new behaviors, which itself is an accomplishment, obviously. But it's more than that. I'm a new person who only chooses certain behaviors. Now I have to choose it because I'm not a tzaddik, so I do have to make a decision. But it's not a terribly difficult decision. Because, yeah, I have free will. Yeah, I could always do whatever I want. That's true. But I have the clarity now that you know, th this choice is authentic, and this choice is a total betrayal of self. So why would I do it? Now, I understand I have the free will to do it. I could do it, but I don't even really want to do it. So <laughs> maybe we can say like this. What does Tanya do for you? It won't take away your ability to sin. It won't even take away the inclination to sin. But it'll make the inclination to sin
much less interesting, much less compelling. Will the voice still come to me? Yeah, of course it will. I'm not a tzaddik. But when it comes to me, at least I have this clarity that it's just noise. Or another way to put it, you got the wrong address. And it's, no, it's annoying when you get a, a letter for the wrong address to your house. And you have to write wrong address and put it back in the mailbox. And yeah, to a certain extent, you know, it does, it is disruptive. But it doesn't pull you in because you look at it and you look at it and you see it's not for me. It's not for me. You got the wrong guy. You're talking to the wrong guy. No, we got the right guy because you used to love to do this. But that's not me. So you're talking to the wrong guy. But of course, <clears throat> the animal soul doing its job is going to try to convince you that you haven't changed, that you are still the same guy. Don't be so holy with us. Don't act so high and mighty. We know what you like. And our response has to be, well, there's a guy who likes that. And I used to be that guy. But I'm not that guy anymore, and you're talking to the wrong guy. So, you know, when, when the Rebbe called Rabbi Garari and he said, or the Rebbe had Rabbi Chadakov, the secretary, call Rabbi Garari, and said, I want to make sure you know that I didn't mean that in a cute way or as a gimmick. I meant it literally. I want to make sure that you understand that when you learn Tanya, you become a new person. You know, I think that's, that's something that we really need to take to heart. That we haven't just learned new information. And even if we've internalized it, it's more than information, you know, we've, we've, we've actualized it, but that's not even all it is. It's not just we've, we've learned new behaviors. When we, when we learn Tanya, and, 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 and the Rebbe's story, what he told Rabbi Gerari, is even one chapter. So it doesn't have to be you spent nine years learning all five volumes of Tanya. Even one chapter, had, to some extent, has a transformative effect, right? When you learn Tanya... You're not just learning new information. You're not just learning a new way of behaving. To some extent, you become a new person. So that when the voices come to you, and they will still come to you because as long as you're not a tzaddik, you will have that duality, and the, 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 the voice of distraction will come to you, but at least you'll know it's just that. It's a distraction. And when he insists, this is not the wrong number, I know exactly who I'm talking to. You're one of my best customers. You're going to tell him, no, that's not me. I'm not that person anymore. And if he asks you, oh, yeah, why am I supposed to believe you're not that same guy anymore? So, first of all, I don't know if you have to even dignify him with a response. But for your own satisfaction if you want to know at least that there is a response right there's an expression by the way the sages say know what to respond to a heretic so there's an explanation of that um of that idiom which is it doesn't say to respond to a heretic it just says know what to respond to a heretic why because Sometimes it's better, don't get into a conversation with the guy. But for your own satisfaction, you would like to know what you would answer if you did get into a conversation so that it doesn't keep you up at night. So, you should know what you could answer. If the question comes to you, yeah, really, you think you're so different you think you really changed. What gives you the uh, bravado to think that you're any different today? So the answer is, an answer is, 
What are you talking about? I learned Tanya. And the Rebbe says that when you learn one chapter of Tanya, you're not the same person anymore. If you learn a lot of chapters, then you're really not the same person. There's obviously, it's not all or nothing. It's not binary. It's not yes or no. There are degrees. Obviously, there are degrees. And by the way, after you learn all the chapters of Tanya, what do you do? You learn them again. Because as good as good is better, nicht besser, like we say in Yiddish, if, if good is good, better is still better. So there are degrees to becoming a new person. Obviously, the, the, there's transformation after transformation after transformation after transformation. But you should know that even if you lo- learned one chapter, you are, to some extent, a different person than the one before studying that chapter. It's a new identity, not just a new way of life. It's a new identity. So that you can know and be secure in your heart of hearts that when the voice of distraction comes to you, you can regard it just as that, as a distraction. And you can tell it, not as a gimmick, not as a cute thing. Ha, 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 I learned Tanya, I'm a new person. No, the Rebbe wanted Rebbe Gerari to know this is serious. This is an earnest thing. that You can respond to your Nefesh Abamas and you can say, I'm telling you, 100% 100% serious, this is not a joke, this is not a gimmick. You're talking to the wrong person. I know you think that you know who lives at this address because yesterday when you came to this address, you got a certain response. I'm telling you, a new person lives at this address today. And... Uh, so if you do, <laughs> here's the good news, and I'll wrap up. If you do that, then you're ready for uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. You're ready already now. Because the new year is a time for a new you. But, you know, like holiday shopping, you can, you can beat the rush. <laughs> Repent now and beat the high holiday rush. So... Self-transformation doesn't have to wait for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. You can do it right now. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. Not only can we do it now, we can do it many times between now and high holidays because we could, we, could, we could become a new person every day. But um, in order for that to happen, you can't just will it to happen. You have to have the right tools. And Baruch Hashem, the Rabbeim, gave us those tools. Tanya is one of the most powerful tools in, in self-transformation. So now you've discovered the secret. Now you have a teacher and you have a group and you have the power of the group and you have a commitment in your life that keeps you anchored. And it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to have Tanya as a regular part of your life. Uh, a Tanya teacher is a regular part of your life. A group of people who are serious about Tanya is a regular part of your life. It's an amazing thing. And um, we should all enjoy, really truly enjoy the, the journey, the discovery, the, uh, the growth of just constantly becoming a new person and... Um, you know, ultimately, that's what it's all about. It's about finding the godliness inside of you. And, and, and just as God is infinite, so that godliness inside of you is infinite. And that's, that's, that's the journey. So now, you know, nine years came to a close. All right, another nine years, and another nine, and another nine. And trust me when I say, after Mashiach comes, we'll continue learning Tanya. In fact, when Mashiach comes, we'll first really start to learn Tanya. All right, Mazel Tov to everybody. Continued success, continued uh, nachas from yourselves, and uh, new discovery. Siva, Rasima Tayyib, Alshana Tayyib, and Masoka. Good, sweet, healthy, happy new year. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Tal. Thank you. You have uh, four minutes for questions? 
Sure. Okay. Okay. Now's your chance. Now's your chance. Hmm. Now we don't have any questions. <laughs> You're laughing because for nine you asked you with questions, huh? <laughs> you cleared it all up. Unbelievable. If if the old person was truly transformed and was that guy I used to be, then why does my old self still pop up? That's not the old self. That's not you. Animal. Animal. It's a it's a voice whose job is to try to th make you think that you're still the old you. That's not you. He's coming and he's speaking as if you were the old you. And you have to tell him you got the wrong guy. We love the old Devorah. Hmm? We love the old Devorah. <laughs> oh, well, that's what we should say to each other. By the way, let me be very, very clear. What we say to ourselves is different than what we say to each other. So what you say to your friend is, you're beautiful, never change. Because that, that's, that's loving. So when you speak to yourself, you say, oy vey, I got to change. Right. Be rough on yourself, be gentle with others. Be different from Yeah. You could say that to our husbands, right? No, no. Oh. Do not be rough on your husband. That's the first person you have to be nice to. Because you're so sensitive. I'm gonna mute myself. Do not weaponize Tanya. <laughs> Great. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Really happy to uh, to be here. So would you give us a does, does Rabbi Shmuley know what we're going to start on next? I don't know. 